Today on Twin Cam, we're taking quite a step out of my comfort zone because my real knowledge of cars begins with the generation of post-war economy cars, stuff like the Beetle, the Miner, and the 2CV. But in this video, we're taking a step further back in time to see what the British motor industry was offering immediately before the Second World War. So with me today is this rather lovely Series 3 Wolseley 10. But before we begin, I think we need a little bit of context, because though I've covered a few Wolseleys before on my channel, we've not seen anything of this age. So the question begs, what is a Wolseley? The Wolseley Sheep Shearing Machine Company was founded by Frederick Wolseley in 1887. And that title shouldn't surprise you, as most of the early car manufacturers started out in life doing something completely different. But what will surprise you is the geography. Because this symbol of middle-class Britain is actually Australian and was based in Sydney. Enter a man named Herbert Austin. I'm sure you're familiar. As a teenager, Austin went off to Australia in search of engineering work and wound up supplying parts to Wolseley. But in 1889, Wolseley moved to England and Austin came home too, becoming manager of the Wolseley company. Within a decade, Austin had branched Wolseley out, and they'd started dipping their toes in car production. But with the two sides of the business doing very different things, the decision was made to split it into two, one doing sheep shearing and one producing cars. Despite them dominating the British market, by 1905 Austin had nearly managed to bankrupt the car company, so he left the ruins and set up his own new company from scratch. Meanwhile, the ruins of Wolseley were saved by the Sidley Motor Company, and over the following decades they continued to grow, exporting cars or knockdown kits to every corner of the globe. But things started to turn again, and in 1926, Wolseley was saved from receivership from another person you might have heard of, William Morris. Within a decade, Wolseley became a full-blown subsidiary of Morris, and even with a hard-earned reputation for producing high-class, quality cars, Wolseley's became, essentially, badge-engineered Morris's. Fast forward a few more decades, and Morris decided to merge with its biggest competitor and form the British Motor Corporation. So, it's here we say hello again to Austin. After 47 years, Austin and Wolseley were the same company, and Wolseley continued to be used as an upmarket name for run-of-the-mill Austin and Morris cars until 1975, when the name was killed off for the sake of rationalisation. The final car to bear the name was the top model of the 1822 series, the car we all know better as the Princess. So with that rigmarole out of the way, we return to the reign of King George, where Britain was a rather different place. As Wolseley was one of Britain's largest manufacturers in the early days of the motor car, there came with it a preconceived market segment. Britain was, and still is, obsessed with class, so that's the easiest lens through which to see what I mean. In this era, the working class could only dream of affording a car, they were the plaything of the middle class and the aristocracy. And while some manufacturers like Ford and Austin gradually established themselves in making people's cars, the most successful manufacturers catered for the middle class, like Wolseley. A Wolseley was never an exceptionally high-end car, but it catered for the middle class professional, the doctors, the lawyers of pre- and interwar Britain. But after the First World War, a lot of Britain's car manufacturers suddenly had a much higher production capacity, because they'd been building engines and aircraft for the war effort. So companies like Wolseley could branch out slightly further afield and build smaller, cheaper cars, that while still the reserve of the middle class, just allowed a few more people to own a car. And after Morris took over, the outlook for Wolseley changed more considerably, as new models could now be based on existing smaller Morris models. So that makes this Wolseley 10 a gentrified version of the Series M Morris 10, which was launched the year before. 
But this is much more than a gentrified Morris. Because despite them sharing quite a lot, the whole car was redesigned to suit the character and market of a Wolseley. And nowhere is that clearer than on the underside. Because the Morris 10 was the first car they'd ever made with unitary construction. But they had to change this car mechanically because the Wolseley is body on frame. Why exactly they did that, I really don't know. Because it sounds like a backward step. However, in this era, a frame was just the way things were done. It meant it was solid, easy to repair, and that anyone could come along and add their own body. That didn't really happen with this because of circumstances, but we'll come back to that later. But for now, let's stick with engineering and turn to the engine. Under here is an 1140cc overhead valve four cylinder, much the same one as you'd find in a Morris 10. Now, traditionally, Wolseley had used their own overhead camshaft engine, which was something you'd only start to find in mainstream cars in the late 1960s. But with Morris now as overlord and this being in a more cost-led market, that was gone and in was the overhead valve lump. But don't let that fool you into thinking this is conventional, because a lot of cars of this era, and some post-war Morrises like the early MM series Miners, use a side valve lump. But back to the Wolseley, and the 10 is there as 10 horsepower. And the majority of old cars were identified by their horsepower rating rather than by a name. But if you aren't familiar with cars of this vintage, 10 horsepower doesn't mean it produces 10 brake horsepower as we'd understand it today. Instead, that figure is the tax horsepower rating. So in the UK, the formula was based on the bore and the number of cylinders to progressively tax larger engine cars. So this sat in the 10 horsepower category. But by our meaning, the power output is about 40 brake horsepower. And that's a really healthy figure for a mainstream 1100cc engine from the 1930s. This is where being a Wolseley becomes part of the deal. Because most 10 horsepower cars were concentrated on value but Wolseley were bringing to the table a small car, not just with pretensions of grandeur, but the ability of it too. Thanks to this engine, this car will exceed 70 miles per hour. And as with the engine's layout, that was still a well-accepted maximum velocity, even a quarter of a century later. The level at which Wolseley themselves saw this car is pretty clear from the press release in 1939, because in the reserved stiff lip society of 1930s Britain, they proclaimed that it is quite useless to compare the performance of this car with anything that has previously been offered in this rating. And it's the topic of grandeur that takes us towards accommodation, because as I've alluded to, Wolseley's were respectable cars for dignified and professional folk. So having a small affordable car isn't an excuse for discomfort. As you'd expect, the 10 has leaf springs all round, but what it also has is a bit of a marketing ploy by Wolseley in elevating perception of their suspension above the competition because this is obviously tuned for comfort. But leaf springs do have a tendency to allow bounce and pitch, and the 10 has what they called phased suspension. And what that actually means is that they just tune the springs and shock absorbers in terms of softness and length in order to reduce pitch and bounce as much as possible. They also did this on the big Wolseleys, but having such a controlled, if still very basic system on a relatively small car was definitely something to write home about, and it was always referenced in period reviews. With Autocar, in their very best British interwar upper-class style, saying it made the 10 conspicuously free from any tendency to pitching. Marvellous. It feels weird getting into a suicide door. It's all backwards and feels completely unnatural to me, but there we are. But inside, the trimming is exceptional. This is a really, really well-appointed interior. It's all wooden leather. And though it does feel as though I'm sat in a radiogram, you can tell that this was definitely a quality product. 
there's no exposed metal in here, for example. It's all lovely wood and leather uh, matched between the dash and on the door cappings. And the fabric around here is all absolutely glorious. It feels very snug and cosy in a very oldie worldy but also very pleasing way. Now, alongside the suicide doors, which are all four of them, um, we also have winding windows, which is nice. And we have these little kind of wind deflectors up here at the top, so you can get a little bit of ventilation without buffeting through the windows. And the windscreen opens as well, which is not something you may see on many cars, at least not many cars post-1945 anyway. But onto this delightfully wooden fascia. And despite this being a small car, we have two ashtrays, one on each side, because of course we do, because it's Britain in this kind of era. And in the dashboard, in the centre, all the gauges are just on this plinth here in the centre, which is really nicely designed. All the little finishes and the edges on it are just right. And we have a speedometer that goes up to 75 miles per hour, properly quick. We have an ammeter fuel gauge, which is on the passenger side. And right in front of you is an oil pressure gauge. Don't know whether that tells you something about it or not, but yep, they decided oil pressure is the thing you need to see. And in the centre, of course, we have the key, we have the light switch sat in the centre, a few of the buttons, button for the start, so the choke, and for the windscreen wipers as well, which, of course, you can operate manually. Brilliant. On the steering wheel itself, which is huge, and there seems to be quite a bit of slop in it, but you know, we'll get over that. We have the button for the horn, and we have the switch for the indicators, for the little semaphores that pop out at the side. Apart from that, we have a little mirror in the centre. We have two delightfully trimmed little sun visors in front of us. We have this huge, huge shelf underneath, and a proper old-fashioned exposed heater box with manual covers for the flaps. Now the driving position is actually really rather good. These seats, not all that supportive, but that's what you'd expect, but they are quite comfortable. And all the controls are exactly where I expect them to be. So the handbrake's in the middle, gear lever is on the floor in the middle, um, and everything is in line with me. The steering wheel is right in front of me. The pedals are exactly where I'd want them to be, though I can see the road through the bottom of the pedal box. And everything feels very, very natural in here. And additionally, something you might not expect is that the steering column is adjustable. Not going to adjust it because it's a bit of a faff, but that's not something you would ever expect in a car of this era. So I suppose you can get a driving position pretty much spot on. All the pedals are mounted from the floor, as you may expect, and the pedals are all very light as well. The clutch pedal is very, very light, and the gear lever clicks nice and precisely into each gear. Massive throw, as you'd expect, but it all clicks and feels very nice, very nicely designed and nicely put together. Oh! Again, this is a small car, those doors are tiny. But in the back, there is stacks of room. Look at all the knee room I have in here. And I've got my own little armrest as well. And the seat is very reclined. This. I'd quite enjoy to spend a bit of time back here, really. It's actually a really nice place to be. Also, I have a little lamp as well. I don't know how that turns on. I won't mess. Um, but I have a little lamp and I've got loads of headroom as well. Again, it's nicely designed and you sit behind the doors, which again, makes it a bit more difficult to get it in, but I have a great view out forwards of me. It's something that a lot of modern car manufacturers seem to have forgotten. And even cars in the 1970s still had this kind of feature where you sit behind the door line. Uh, which means you just get a great view out and you feel like a king sat back here. But what all the legroom and the headroom and the armrests and stuff do not cover is generally how small it is. It's worse in the front, but because of the traditional tapering body, it's really narrow in here. Uh, the total width of the car is not at all matched by uh, the amount of room in the cabin. This is before manufacturers had really learned how to package cars properly. and. Though it feels very luxurious in some ways, especially for a small car of the era, you've got to be very friendly with your passengers. And with you sitting so far back in the body, the boot isn't all that big. It has these beautiful straps and it falls down. You know, relatively, there is quite a lot of space in there. It's very deep, but most of it is taken up by the spare wheel. 
But having gone through all the Wolseley-ish bits, we step outside and it just looks like a Morris 10 with a different grille. And that's strange, because with the Wolseley having a separate chassis, it has a shorter wheelbase than the equivalent Morris. Again, that's weird because this is meant to be the luxurious version, but this is a very different era of motoring, so possibly I'm misleading myself. It would make sense to me, at least, for them to have left the underside the same and just changed the styling, from a marketing point of view. But in this instance, I don't think that similarity is such a bad thing, because this is a lovely looking car. Although upright and staid, as you'd expect from any conservative British car, really, from this era, the Wolseley is actually rather sleek. It's much more curvaceous, less stodgy and less awkward looking than the old Wolseley 1040 it replaced. Because this has a really well resolved style and the proportions are just about perfect. The old car had an outrageously long bonnet that seemed grafted onto a car styled by someone else. But for the new 10, it all flows just about right. Every body line flows from one panel to another and resolves itself naturally. There's zero harshness to the shape. The line of the bonnet panel, for instance, carries on through the scuttle panel, into the doors and out to jaunt downwards into the rear wheel arch. It's just simply a very pretty little car. And that point is one to mention, little. Because most cars of this size weren't like that at all. They were usually boxier and more utilitarian. So again, let's go back to that press release. Because the lines of the new 10 will be characteristically Wolseley. Distinguished, dapper, but without any extravagant eccentricities which might tend to affect the resale value of a car. The new Wolseley 10 was launched in February 1939, and shock horror, that wasn't a very good year to be launching new cars. But production only ended for the war effort in 1941, and the key here is that production started before the war. Because of the war, it restarted in 1945, and this is one of the last from 1948, by which point the world was a wholly different place. Britain was a wholly different country, and cars like this were at an end. A car like the 10, therefore, lay on the fence between interwar and modern Britain. Because for 1939, this was a compact, efficient, affordable and relatively modern car. But by 1948, it was already history. Compared to the cars that were beginning to be launched, it was incredibly conservative, both stylistically and mechanically. Then, looking at the bigger picture, it sat in an intensely class-oriented market that had all but disappeared now. And the demand for small but luxurious cars had also dried up, because these things had become very expensive. The price had jumped from £215 to £474, and as a result, the 10 wasn't ever directly replaced. We can see this then as the end of the vintage motor car, because the stuff that came later, like the MO Morris Oxford and Wolseley 450, were distinctly different, not just stylistically, but with independent suspension, rack and pinion steering and monocoque construction. And that makes this the final true slice of old English motoring. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twincam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.